Welcome to Bible Breakthrough. Carl Steinman loved to explore volcanoes. Once when he was looking at a volcano in Iceland, he came too close to the edge. His guide warned him not to do that because the volcano was active. The earth rumbled under his feet and he slipped and he fell over a crater. <laughs> he later wrote about his experience and this is what he said. Oh, the horrors of that awful realization. There over the mouth of a black and heated abyss, I was held suspended, a helpless and conscious prisoner, to be hurled downward by the next great throw of trembling nature. Help, 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 for the love of God, help, he cried. He shrieked in agony and in despair. I had nothing to rely upon but the mercy of heaven. And I prayed to God as I had never prayed before for the forgiveness of my sins. More tremors sent rocks tumbling down the sides of the crater and rolling down below. But Steinman's terrified pleas were answered by his guide who, risking his life, scrambled to rescue him, shouting, I warned you, you did, he cried. But forgive me and save me, for I am perishing. Many folks compare this experience to what it may be like to go into the pit or into the very hell itself. Many folks have used this illustration to talk about what it would be like to go to hell. Hell is a big and important topic. Folks talk about it, preach about it. Discuss it. But what does the Bible have to say about hell? On Bible Breakthrough today, we're going to learn many different things and search through our Bibles to discover that God's way is far better than we could have imagined. For example, nowhere in the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts is hell actually that place of fire. For example, in Hebrew... The word sheol that we see in the Psalms and other parts refers to grave or pit. However, when it's translated over 65 times, though it means grave or pit, it's translated 34 times with the word hell. In Greek, the word Hades is used, which is equivalent to sheol. That word in the King James Version 10 of the 11 times is translated as hell. There's a problem here. Are you seeing it? The word Gehenna occurs 12 times in the original manuscripts of the New Testament, and the, New, and the King James Version translates it as hell 12 times. Jesus talked about Gehenna, and it's often used as hell. The Greek word Tartarus occurs only one time in the original manuscript. And it means a prison or a place of spiritual darkness. So, the question today, what is hell? And what's it like? What does the Bible have to say? It's time for a Bible breakthrough. Ellie, David, what is hell? And what does the Bible have to say about it? Certainly, it is a hot place. It seems like as we look at the Bible, and I certainly would not want to be on the side of a cliff over a volcano. You know, I think a lot of questions when you look at uh, hell, I think one of the biggest questions is, is it going on right now? What does the Bible say uh, about that? Is hell going right on right now? Well, I think if we turn in our Bibles to John five twenty eight and 29, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and turn to chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. And let's see if the Bible tells us where people are right now. Verse 28 says, and this is Jesus speaking, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection 
of condemnation. Now, if they were burning in hell now, how could they come forth at a resurrection? Well, it makes it very clear there that they're coming, they're going to hear his voice, those that are in the graves. They're not in heaven, they're not in hell. It's very specific. They will hear his voice, those that are in the graves, and they will come out. They will come forth. So the people are in the grave. What about hell? Is hell burning now? I don't think so. I think. What does the Bible have to say on that? When you look at 2 Peter 3, verse 7, it says, The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So it, it's not burning now, in other words, it, but it's on the day of judgment. There was going to be a fire. Yes. That, that's what the Bible is telling us so far. Yes. Second Peter 2.9 pretty much says the same thing. It says, Second Peter 2, verse 9, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So at the day of judgment, there's going to be a calling forth of the good and the bad from the grave. There's going to be a judgment of some sort. And we know the Bible talks about fire. The question is, what is that fire designed for? And what will happen on that day of judgment to the bad and to the righteous? Matthew 25, verse 41 says, again, Jesus is speaking. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So that fire is prepared for the devil and his angels, and it will burn and it will take place at the judgment. Now, th this idea of hell we hear it all the time, and it's a fearful thing. I mean, we've all heard excerpts of, read excerpts of that famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, how hell will be this eternal place of torment. And what's interesting to me is as I've studied um, and looked at some research and statistics, uh, folks that have been asked this question on heaven or hell, um, they all say, that their family, their loved ones, and themselves will be in heaven. No one ever says that they're going to be in that judgment of the unrighteous. And so we, we, we tend to look away from it or not apply it, while other people use hell as the motivator to love God. I have a real problem with that. I do too. Because I, I can't come to my father and say, Dad, I love you when I'm so afraid of him, and when he says, you either tell me you love me and obey me, or I will absolutely torture you forever and ever. My response to my father should be one of love. And love is what Calvary is all about. Love and mercy, justice and mercy, is what the kingdom of God is all about. And so hell is for real. There's going to be a grave. There's Hades. There's Sheol a place of darkness, and we're going to talk more about that. And there is a fire, Ellie, as you read to us in yes. Matthew, that is reserved for the devil and for his angels. This idea of an ever-burning hell does not come out of Christianity. Where does it come from? The idea of an ever-burning hell came down through paganism from Babylon uh, to Egypt. And the concept, they burned their children in the fire, and the concept of an ever-burning hell that tortured people slipped into the back of the church when paganism was brought into the church in the era of Constantine, and it took root. And when the early Bible was translated, Jerome translated uh, Bible from, uh, into Latin, and he believed in an ever-burning hell, and he translated many of the words that you talked about, um, Gehenna, for example, and uh, Sheol, as hell. And it has slipped into the church. It's a horrible doctrine. God is not going 
to torture people. But the problem or the challenge that we face is that many Bible-based places and churches are preaching on this everlasting place of torment. And, and they use passages, you know, we talked about the language and how the actual Hebrew and Greek was translated incorrectly. But we just want to talk about it for just a moment because the rich man and Lazarus is often used as a confirmation that there is an everlasting hell fire when Lazarus was with Abraham in Abraham's bosom and where the rich man was in this place of torment that he wanted to just mm -hmm. wet his tongue with a little bit of water. Um, but Jesus specifically said that the reason he used that parable was for the people to realize that even if one rose from the even if one rose from the dead, notice he says, even if they did, he says, they will not hear. And in verse 31 he says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Jesus was going to rise from the dead. That's the point of the parable. Not that heaven is Abraham's bosom, or that there's going to be this eternal place of torment but that Jesus was there and they were not being persuaded by the Son of God. I think, Pastor Minner, as you look at this, I find the text that we have covered bringing great reassurance that people that are wicked are not in hell right now. And that when you look at God and God's great love for us, it, what is the motivation that we have for serving God. It says here in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, he says, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. The idea that God loves us, it's a permanent love. The idea that there's an everlasting hell that takes place, it, it's sad to think of that it's forever. But the idea is, is that it's God's love that's permanent, that's lasting. That's our lasting. motivator. That's what motivates us. And you know, how would it be heaven? Suppose we were in heaven and somebody we loved had missed heaven and they're in hell. How would that be heaven to you? Would you fly through the heavens or visit another planet hmm. and over there is a fire burning and people screaming and crying? And that's exactly what happens in Luke 17. With the parable, when you take it literal, Ellie, we run into the problem you're bringing out to us right now. Right. Because if I could look from heaven and see my loved one horrible. in torment, that's not heaven. Not heaven at all. Not at all. And God doesn't want to torture us. In fact... If you turn to Isaiah 28, verse 21, he calls the act of destroying or having to purify the earth, it's called God's strange work. Verse 21, For the Lord will rise up as the Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his work, awesome work and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. And some versions of the Bible say his strange act, something that is foreign to God because he loves us so much. So it's going to be an act that is unnatural to God right? because God doesn't like to destroy. He doesn't seek to torment eternally or to bring agony that is indescribable. That's not God's purpose. No for humanity, for our families, and for us. God wants to put an end of wickedness, and this is the way it's done. Now, you say God wants to bring an end to wickedness. How then will the wicked be consumed? How will it all come to pass? Because you read earlier that there is a fire. We saw that just in reviewing, that uh, there is no fire now, but there will be a fire in the judgment. Uh, we saw how Jesus said that he would raise... The, the dead from the grave, some to life and some to judgment. And you read also, Ellie, for us how hell was designed for Satan and his angels. So the question again that we're asking is, what then is going to take place at the end when the judgment occurs? 
There'll be a destruction of the wicked. What will it look like? If we go to 2 Peter 3, verse 7, it gives us a picture. It said, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of the ungodly. So they will, so they will burn up. So the fire will take place in the judgment. Now, the question is, how long will it burn and will it finally stop? Will the wicked be consumed once and for all? I want a Bible breakthrough on this topic so that I don't live in fear. Okay. So that I can experience what God truly meant for us to understand. In Matthew 25, verse 46, it says, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And in Matthew, the same chapter, verse 41, how does that read for us? Well, we read that earlier with the, with the destruction of the angels. When we're looking at, it says, You cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, when you look at these passages, it is very clear that this word everlasting comes up many times. And the question is, is what, what does this everlasting mean? Does this mean forever? Uh, this fire is going on and on. And that's where a lot of people have concerns about burning forever. If they burn forever... If you go to hell and there's an everlasting, ever-burning hell, that would mean sinners would be immortal. And we know they're not immortal. Only God is immortal. Our Bible breakthrough is found in Jude, verse 6 and 7. And it reads like this. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, here it is, he has reserved an everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And now, will the fire ever burn or stop burning? Verse 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual morality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? question. They're in the bottom of the Dead Sea. So they're not still burning. But the consequence, the result of their judgment was eternal. So Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction was permanent. Mm -hmm. And the destruction of the wicked will have permanent, forever eternal results. That fire will have an eternal result. Malachi chapter 4 backs up what you're saying. Chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. They're gone. Second Peter 2, verse 6 says, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. It's very clear that with what Ellie read there in Malachi, the Bible is teaching that forever is, is the, the permanence that you're referring to. Many say that this is an endless, ongoing fire. It's not endless. It's the result. It's a consequence. And the way we know that, the way we know that the person will not burn forever and ever. Ellie, I think you made reference to it earlier, is that God alone has immortality. Where is that in the Bible so that we can First remember Timothy, this verse? First Timothy 6, 16. Mm -hmm. It's a good verse to memorize for all of us. It says, Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. This is God. The wicked do not have immortality, nor do we. So they will come to an end. Yes. It will be yes. wrapped up. The wicked will be put mm -hmm. to an eternal death 
from which there is no resurrection, from which there is no return, because they die. They are not immortal, as you just read to us. Revelation 20 also clearly indicates what will happen. Look at Revelation 20, verses 13 and 14. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So it has a name, and it's not hell. It's the second death for what happens. And you read from Matthew earlier how Jesus says that the fire is reserved for the devil and for his angels. And now at the very end, just the last two chapters of the Bible, we're finding that the dead have come to life, and now the wicked are being judged. And they are judged and they are consumed along with death and Hades or the grave, which is the word again that sometimes is translated hell. They are there cast into the lake of fire and they will be destroyed. Death will be destroyed. Hades will be destroyed by fire. A fire that will be there on the judgment. Very important, very important important point to remember. God is not tormenting your loved ones in this agony that is indescribable. They are in the grave awaiting that great day when the judgment will take place. Because the Bible says that we will all stand before God. That's why the prophet Amos says, prepare to meet your God. We will stand before the judgment, before God. Nahum 1.9 says, at the end of verse 9 says, affliction will not rise up a second time. This is great comfort and reassurance that God will put an end to all the wickedness, all the suffering, everything that's going on in this world. Because God's ultimate plan for us is for us to experience the joy of eternal life with him. Immortality, incorruption, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, that will be given to us at the sound of the last trumpet when Christ comes again. It's then that we will be given the gift of eternal life. By faith we receive it now, but it's bestowed on us when Christ comes in glory. The Bible ends in chapter 21 and 22, Revelation, by telling us what God's desired will is for each one of us. And it says in verse 3 that John, who saw this revelation, John says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4, this is what God wants to do. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow. If there is no more sorrow, over and across the universe. That means that it is over with the agony, the suffering, and the torment. It means that there is no more crying. There are not souls crying out of hell because it's over. The fire has consumed and brought an end to sin once and for all. They will be as ashes under our feet. David, you read there just a moment ago, no sorrow nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Did you hear that? No more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. That's what God wants for all of us. Look forward to that great day. Second Peter reiterates this, what we need to look, be looking for. Second Peter 3, verse 12 and 13, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And I like Isaiah 65, verse 17. 
It says, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. Mm. And the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Amen. So we're not going to mourn those who choose not to be saved. And it is a choice. It's a choice that each of us choice. must make. As our time together on Bible Breakthrough has come to an end for this study, we'd like to just review with you the fact that the Bible teaches us that there will be a fire, that there will be a day of judgment where we will stand before God, but that that fire will bring an end to sin, to sinners, to Satan and his angels, and they will be no more. I'm comforted in this because I too have, I can think of a specific loved one that I know never accepted Christ. He was loved by our family, but he never gave his heart to the Lord. At his death, or at his funeral, when I was there, I had to talk about the fact that we all die. But I also used that time to talk about how loving our God is. There is no one that I would rather have judge me than God. Because God is love and he has not treated us as we deserve. He is a God of mercy, but he's also a God of justice. And so we take comfort in the fact that our loved ones are in the grave awaiting that judgment hour. But when that judgment does take place and the fire does come, it will consume them and they shall be no more. And those that have accepted Christ will reign with him forever and ever. I pray that you make your decision to follow Jesus, not from fear, but because he loved you so much that he gave his life for you, that you may spend eternity with him. Accept Christ today. Know that he is a God of love and mercy. We'll see you next time on Bible Breakthrough. And remember, keep studying your Bibles.